Hi, this is Andrew Julina, host of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. In this inaugural episode, number 001, I talk about getting into programming as a kid myself, how you can get your kids into programming, and provide some tips and tricks and tools and resources for you to do so. Underserved is a production of Syrinx Studios. Hit it. My motivation for creating this podcast, I was sick of gadget worship. Look at this USB dongle doodad. You have to have it. In order to get it, make sure you use my affiliate link below, smash that like button, and hit the bell for more notifications that you don't want. No thank you. There was already another set of podcasts that talked about startup worship. Have you ever seen Silicon Valley, the comedy that's on HBO? It's got that guy from the Verizon commercials with the curly hair in it. Well, Silicon Valley is funny because it's true. I've heard one too many times about how there's some disruptive startup that's going to change the world and forever influence how I watch cat videos. And what about companies that aren't startups? There's a whole ton of us in the industry that don't work in a startup. We've still got interesting things going on. Let's talk about them. And then there's the tech news podcasts. It's the same stuff rehashed over and over. Yes, we know Tesla is going to be late in delivering their most amazing new feature. We know that Facebook is taking our data and selling it to anyone who will pay for it. And Google is serving us ads for something that we've never actually uttered out loud and only thought about, which is really creepy. But this isn't news. It's olds. It's the same stuff over and over again. Been there, done that, seen it, hated it. Next. I like to tell stories, so here we're going to tell real stories and lessons learned from top technologists in the industry. How did they get their start? What were the seminal moments in their career, and what did they learn from them? What sort of tools are they using? And what scares them about technology, even though they understand so much about it? And what sort of interesting hobbies do they have, and how can I find out more about them? This is all available right now on our website, which is underserved.libsyn.com. Listen right now to our podcast, even on mobile, right there in the browser. Or if you have a favorite podcast client, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever, we've got links to subscribe with those too. There's a link in the description in order to get all of those. But if you're feeling especially lazy today, don't do anything. Just sit there. I've cut and pasted the entire first episode of Underserved into this video. So you can just sit back and listen to it right now. Don't have to do a thing. It all starts in three, two, one. <laughs> Welcome to the inaugural edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the technology industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. I wanted to talk to you about my motivation for starting this podcast. As you know, podcasts are more popular than ever, and there's a ton of them, especially technology podcasts. But of the ones I liked and listened to, it seemed like many of them really fell into two categories. The first I'll call startup worship. You know, when people talk about the industry, a lot of attention is paid to product startups. They're the sexy lottery tickets that everyone likes to gossip about. You heard the story about the founders who invented a widget program in their garage, and they bootstrapped and scrapped their way to their first sale. And they took on angel and venture capital investments and grew like wildfire. And they IPO'd and cashed out to buy McLarens and mansions. You know, I like that story as much as anyone, but I feel like I've heard it too many times. I'm in the technology industry, but I really live a different life from that. I started programming when I was 11 years old, entered the industry working for a big company, then consulting back to a big company, and finally owning my own consulting business. And along the way, I I met some interesting folks, made some good friends, did some interesting things, and accumulated a bunch of stories. So I wanted to share some of my stories from the technology industry that didn't have to do with startup worship, as well as the stories of many of those friends that I've made along the way. And I want to talk about the things that the rest of us think about and live through and kind of cover the other fringes of the technology scene. So Underserved is the podcast for those who are underserved by the current technology podcast content. The other one that I see a lot of, both YouTube videos and podcast content, is gadget worship. You know, the unboxing and the reviews and using it and abusing it and so on. You know, what is the latest and greatest watch? And here's something you never asked for, but now you can't live without it. Everyone has to lust after it. And don't get me wrong, I love a good piece of functioning technology. It's like magic when it works. And we will mention and endorse some products and services that we feel are battle-tested, things that we 
use every day and are excited and enthusiastic about, but I will try hard not to uh, make any unboxing videos or uh, just do product review after reviews in any episode. So for episode one here, wanted to define what we are and are not, which we did, provide some content and background and kind of set the tone for future episodes. This one's just going to be me talking, but future ones will often be interviews or discussions with other folks. As far as timeless versus timely, we're not going to cover news, you know, and current events and things that kind of tend to make a podcast go stale quickly. We're going to try to pick topics that are going to be relevant for years to come. So if you discover this podcast down the road and then start cruising through the back catalog, it still makes sense and it's still relevant. Not to say nothing will be timely or we won't make predictions about the future, but, um, you know, as a message to those from the future, if you're a completist and you came back here to start from episode one, hopefully the evolution should make sense. So a lot of the episodes we're going to do start with one question. How did you get into programming? So I'll answer it first. When I was in fourth grade at the Juniper Park Elementary School in Westfield, Massachusetts, they had a Apple IIe running a programming language called Logo. And in Logo, it was basically a little turtle on the screen, and you could tell it to do things like go forward 10 pixels, then turn right 90 degrees, then repeat four times, and, you know, that would make a square. And I was always fascinated by this, and when we were around, allowed to do it, I think as part of like an enrichment program or something like that, uh, you know, I always bugged them for extra time. I always wanted to work with it more and spend a little more time trying to make the turtle do something interesting or repeat some pattern or so forth. And then I went to some summer camps, you know, the usual day camps and sleepover camps and so forth. But there was one in particular that I really liked. It was at the Wilbraham Munson Academy. They had all sorts of different nerdy courses you could take at this summer camp, like chess and rocketry and programming. So I got a chance to do some basic programming there. They had some equipment that had been donated by Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, DEC was a really big technology company here in Massachusetts for many years. And I do have to commend them. They did get their gear into uh, a lot of schools. And uh, I'm sure more folks than myself uh, were kind of cut their teeth doing early development on deck systems. But I definitely had the bug after doing that summer camp and some of the other things we were doing in school. So I, I constantly bothered my parents to get a computer so I could program. So they finally broke down. Uh, for my 11th birthday, I got a Commodore VIC-20, which uh, if you are unfamiliar, it had 3.6 kilobytes of RAM, tiny, tiny amount. You know, my, I, my phone has thousands of times that now. It stored programs on audio cassette tapes, so you'd have to rewind them and then play them if you wanted to read your program back or hit record and play in order to record your programs out of the cassette tapes. The tapes were definitely finicky. Um, you could pretty easily lose data if you weren't careful. It was uh, definitely a tough system to love at times, but I was on it every day, either writing my own programs or typing in programs that I had read out of magazines, trying to get them to work. Mostly I wanted to build games. I uh, built a few original ones, got a few of the ones from magazines working and tweaked elements in them and so forth. And I would do that for hour after hour in my room, um, just programming, trying to learn new things, you know, trying to figure out things for the magazines. I mean, this was, there were BBSs at the time, bulletin board systems, but I didn't have a modem and, you know, I had no real connection. So it was mostly, you know, reading books and magazines and experimenting by myself, trying to get better. I had a couple friends who were also into programming, so we would kind of discuss things here and there, but there really wasn't much of a scene yet. Uh, once I got to high school, programming became a little more common. Uh, again, Digital Equipment Corporation had put this, uh, I think it was a PDP 1170 into Westfield High School. And one teacher in particular, Lauren Belisle, encouraged me to do programming classes and after school things and encouraged a bunch of other kids to do the same and actually formed a programming team. And so the Westfield High School programming team would compete in competitions against uh, other schools and we placed in a few of them and we won a few of the competitions. I recently found a commendation we got from the principal for one of the wins we had the other day. My mom was uh, quite a good pack rat when it came to that stuff. So all throughout high school, I did programming. But when it came time for college, I just I couldn't picture myself as a CS major and didn't know if my mostly self-taught and only a few courses experience was going to be good enough to do well in CS. 
Uh, my dad had been a business major. Uh, my mom had uh, taken a bunch of courses in business. So I thought, you know what, I'll go into business. And I picked operations management, which is a relatively dry discipline. Uh, a lot of folks who came out of OM back then became ISO 9000 quality system auditors. But uh, in addition to the standard accounting and operations management courses and so forth, I took a bunch of computer science courses while I was in college at UMass, data structures, algorithms, et cetera. Eventually got a job working in the computer lab there as well. And then I uh, met some guys from my dorm, um, one of whom I remember, Dave Cotter. He said, uh, hey, there's actually this graduate level computer animation course. It's really cool. You get to work with this cool software that I helped develop along with these other guys. And I think you should get involved with it. So I ended up taking Coin 691 Advanced Computer Animation. And through it, met Adam Levine and Dennis Chen, these two guys that had started a company and made a product called Infinity, like I-N-F-I-N-I-D. And this was an animation program for the Mac. And this is back in, gosh, 92, 93. And you needed a Mac with a 68030 math coprocessor in order to run it. And I had one that just barely qualified. It's one of those old pedestal style Macs, but it had the math coprocessor so it could run infinity. So I would play with it in my dorm room and then go across the street to the computer science lab and use it on some more powerful hardware. And we used it to animate some scenes and add music to it and so forth and do kind of a semester long project. I thought that was really cool, and I thought it was neat to meet people that had built a functioning system and company out of UMass. And then in 93, I saw Mosaic, uh, the web browser, um, 93 to 94, was the first few times I saw it, and I could see that was going to change everything. I was really excited about the World Wide Web, also interested in hacker activity and phone freaks and just learning anything I could about technology. I attended the first HOPE conference, the Hackers on Planet Earth, uh, run by 2600 Magazine, the Hacker Magazine. And did some hardware hacking myself. I built a DTMF decoder that could listen to audio and decode touch tones from it. And I built a radio transmitter, receiver, some other things, just little projects, hacking stuff together. And I ended up doing a co-op um, down at American Saw in East Long Meadow for about a year. I did an extra year of college, ended up graduating in 95, and took a job with EDS, Electronic Data Systems. And that uh, was a great first job. Um, it was a big focus there on developing their employees and training. I did a bunch of computer-based training, the CBTs. Uh, anytime I finished my work and didn't have something else to do lined up right away, I would do a CBT. And it was perfect timing. As the internet was coming of age, I was learning about TCP IP and UDP and the SMTP protocol, DNS, like all the underpinnings of how the internet worked. And then they would pay to do educational reimbursement so I could take night courses at places like Harvard and Northeastern to learn C, C++, object-oriented analysis and design, etc. The other good thing uh, about working at a big company was I learned how version control worked and how to work with a group of developers and how to check things in and tag releases and do builds, do testing, log bug reports, you know, do rebuilds, retesting, you know, make release candidates, see how that moves through different environments from development to testing, staging, production, so forth. They, they don't teach that in college. And I, I still, I don't think they do to this day. I've talked to a few of our interns and other young folks who are taking computer science now, and it doesn't seem like version control and release management and so forth is really covered at all in college. So if there's any professors listening, uh, prove me wrong or uh, let me know if you're going to add that sort of thing to your curriculum. I think it's definitely a value add and helps college kids hit the ground running when they're graduating and moving on to working in a bigger group of developers and potentially doing multiple releases, point releases, bug fixes, and so forth. It's just a, it's a great skill set to have. They can pick it up on the job like I did, but hey, if you're able to graduate knowing it already or do it through a co-op, why not? So I met some good people there at EDS, some of whom I'm still in touch with, took a bunch of courses, night courses, and through one of them, started moonlighting at a consulting job with a company called Web Technology Partners. 
And that moonlighting eventually led to a full-time opportunity, and I ended up joining WebTech uh, February 17th, 1997 as a consultant. So I was W-2, but I was paid hourly to develop software for clients. And so I did an awful lot of software development in 97, 98, 99. The company grew rapidly, mostly doing C++ and Java work out of our office in Lowell, Massachusetts. And then a manager that we had worked with at one of our biggest clients went to a new company. And he pulled me and a coworker, Chris, down to work with them. So we went to this new client in July 1999, and they were called Monster.com. I knew very little about Monster when I went down there. I uh, knew very little about their business model, culture, or even their technology. I didn't know a whole lot about ASP pages and com objects and VB. I had been doing a bunch of Java and C++. But over the next year, did a bunch of projects for Monster in those technologies, and we grew out our team there and became kind of a de facto development arm and ended up getting bought by Monster in June of 2000. So we all became Monster employees. And actually, there are some folks from Web Technology Partners who are still working at Monster. So that was a great company to join at a great time. I mean, they were a a success story, a big company owned by an even bigger company, TMP Worldwide, both of them printing money at the time. Tons of volume, tons of upside, met a lot of great people, most importantly, my wife. We met at Monster and were married in 2003. I uh, got a lot of great technical experience getting Microsoft.net to scale to extreme volumes at Monster and saw an early software as a service business success story. And Monster was one of the greatest stories back then being successful. So I left Monster in 2003 to start growing another consulting company, and that's Syrinx. And since then, I've done .NET development, project management, Android development, React, even recently done some Vue.js. But I've also been very involved in how we grow and run the company on the sales and recruiting sides, and ended up using a lot of what I learned in my operations management degree. So along the way, I've worked with a lot of software developers to consult for our clients and build things for them. Got to know the full-time folks at our clients. We tend to work with larger companies, not startups. So another difference from your average podcast, you know, we're working with a bigger company, you know, probably 100 million to a few billion in revenue. They need projects done, don't have uh, enough of the right folks or the right folks to get it done. And they're bringing us in to help them get their projects out the door on time and on budget. And consulting is kind of a different animal. It's a, really another way of looking at the same industry. And this topic, you know, what it means to consult and so forth, it, it can easily have its own podcast, maybe two. Uh, it's a whole different way of looking at things. Some things are great. Some things are kind of more difficult than being a full-time employee somewhere. But again, we'll cover that later on. So I wasn't a computer science major, but I did take CS courses. I took advantage of those CBTs, the computer-based training. But nowadays on the web, there are tons of free and inexpensive paid sites to learn how to code. And in this series, we'll talk to people who went to school for CS, maybe some who majored in it, or some who just took some courses in it like I did. And some people just picked up a keyboard, started coding something, and then freelanced until they had enough experience and credibility to eventually quit their day jobs and become full-time programmers. So one way to get started, even my kids have done this, there's an hour of code at code.org where you can go and try some basic exercises and, you know, move things around the screen and try out for loops and conditional logic and see how the actual code works underneath. And if you like it, you can stick with it. I'll put some resources in the show notes where you can learn popular languages like JavaScript. And these are actually applicable in the marketplace. Underserved is fortunate to be sponsored by Syrinx, the developer-founded, developer-run software consulting company. Syrinx provides bolt-on software development capacity to accelerate your software projects. Syrinx works with your team and your methodology, on-site or off-site, to deliver on-time and on-budget. They work in any technology stack, React, Angular, Java, .NET, Python, front-end, back-end, NoSQL, MySQL, any SQL you work with, they have experts. You need architects, developers, QA folks, project managers, analysts, data scientists. Syrinx can help you everywhere in your software development lifecycle, anywhere in the United States. Syrinx also does complete outsourced software project development if you need a turnkey end-to-end -end solution, or if you just need an individual resource to fill a development gap. With 100% of their resources onshore and a 20-year track record of success, you can trust Syrinx to get it right the first time. You can reach them today at syrinx.com or 888 5 Syrinx. 
Expand your software development bandwidth at syrinx.com. We'll also include the underserved, undeserved endorsement, the UUE. This week, it's going to be Reddit. If you haven't checked out Reddit yet, R-E-D-D-I-T dot com. You can read it in your web browser, or there are several applications available for both Android and iOS. It is a huge site that folks go on to post all sorts of different topics. So under the main reddit.com, there's slash r slash anything you could imagine. News, today I learned, awe, A-W-W, if you just want to pick cute pictures of dogs and cats and so forth. A uh, bunch of not, not safe for work content too, if you're not careful, but a whole lot of really good content. And then folks upvote and downvote articles. They tend to float to the top of a subreddit or the top of what they call the front page, which is a collection of the top articles from all those subreddits. There's interesting content on there. It can almost be addictive. You got to kind of limit how many times a day you go and check it out. But there's, you know, if you, you want to see the fresh memes before your kids even see them, uh, all that stuff's on there. It's just a ton of interesting content 24 hours a day that's constantly updating and upvoting. So I like all of those subreddits that I mentioned. Um, Today I Learned is usually interesting. There's some sort of random Wikipedia thing you've never seen or some sort of fact from history that you've never heard of uh, that kind of bubbles up to the top there. So if you haven't checked it out, try it out, reddit.com, R-E-D-D-I-T.com, or check out one of the Reddit apps in the App Store or Google Play. I have a few other questions I'm going to subject everyone to, so I'll be the guinea pig. What would you tell someone starting out? Uh, I would say there's never been a better time to start programming. So many resources, so many online. You never have to leave your bedroom and you could connect with thousands of people online. Use things like Stack Overflow or live forums in order to get help with things. There's so many resources in order to learn things. So many computer-based trainings that now are available on the internet. Uh, I would focus on JavaScript on the front end. It's so popular. Pick a framework. Um, You don't have to get it right, but I would say there was a lot of Angular and React. Then React started taking over. Now Vue and some other frameworks are becoming popular. And learn both NoSQL and regular, you know, relational database SQL on the back end. And that's going to cover 99% of, you know, back end database storage you're going to run into. And for a compiled language, I'd say Java is a good bet. Although there's, you know, some arguments to be made for some more recent languages as well. Another question, what is interesting to you? Uh, I always like to find out, you know, how people came up, how they got involved in the industry, what drives them, what makes them tick. Finding commonalities too, you know, the things that are common denominators or things that you see over and over again across good developers. There's a few that are, uh, you know, we tend to talk about during interviews with folks uh, that we see over and over. One's what we'll call the hobbyist angle. Uh, We love folks that program because they love it and whether or not they were doing it for a job, they would be programming. You know, even if they had some other completely different job and completely different industry, they would be going home and programming and working on side projects. And a lot of programmers will have a side project or more than one side project that they're working on at any given time. You know, folks that are hobbyists and do things to learn them or to build some cool thing. Um, it's a really good habit. We also like folks that are tool builders. I was always a, you know, tool builder. I liked writing code generators. I liked writing parsers. I liked writing scrapers. <laughs> I ended up doing an awful lot of that in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, you know, with a ton of Perl. And, of course, now there's other more modern languages to do the same, but Perl's still available. And sometimes uh, I will revert to it because I know it very well in order to get some text processing done quickly. Another good trait is people that like to mentor other people and teach other people, you know, that like to take maybe that tool that they built and not just hoard it for themselves, but institutionalize it across their department and save a bunch of other people time and effort being good lazy, you know, figuring out that you need to do something over and over and then building a tool in order to automate and solve that so that it's much easier to do all those repetitive times when it comes up. Ask folks, what editor are you using now? Uh, For me, that's Android Studio because I've been taking some Android projects and off of GitHub and building them and learning from them. And we also have an Android project that we're working on for kind of a Skunk Works proof of concept that we're doing now that uh, uses a lot of location-based technology in order to do live updates with all these clients in the field. 
So seeing how that stuff works under the covers and getting it to work and debugging it and writing back and forth with different backend technologies like relational databases and Firebase. I think Firebase is a really neat tool for being able to do real-time updates. It's uh, It really kind of seems like magic compared to the stuff that we used to hand roll in order to do that years ago. Also use VS Code because it's free, tons of plugins for it. Um, if you just need to drag a big JSON file somewhere and edit it, it's a good tool for that. Also used to use Sublime Text a fair amount. Uh, got pretty good with that. Like anything that you can get started with relatively inexpensively and it has the kind of tool chain that you need in order to do your JavaScript you know, processing before you actually serve it up and debug it and so forth. You know, it gets my nod, but that's the one I've been using. Favorite tools. I guess the number one, everyone will accuse, everyone that knows me will accuse me of being an uh, unpaid Evernote zealot. But hey, you know, if, if it works and it's worked for years, it's kind of hard to argue with. I use Evernote as a substitute for actually having short-term and long-term memory. I put everything in there. So Evernote, if you're not familiar, um, there's other competing technologies. Microsoft has OneNote, and I think there's a few others, but Evernote been around for a long time. Uh, I picked up using it probably eight or nine years ago, and it allows you to take notes on any platform, and they get synced to the cloud and synced across all devices. So at the very least, I could sit at my computer and use either their app or their web-based client to type something in there. And then later on, if I need to refer to it from my phone, it's already synced on there. But you can also attach images. And Evernote does some pretty crazy processing on the back end where they can actually do text recognition within images, and then they can index that text. So if you took a picture of a whiteboard that said podcast on it, they would actually figure out that the PODCAST was in there and they would put that in the document corpus so it would become searchable. So if you search for PODCAST in the search box in Evernote, that note would match because that image had that word inside it. So it's pretty crazy. There's also the ability to use their Web Clipper, which is an extension for Chrome. So I use this all the time, both on my mobile, if I'm reading something and I want to save it, you can save an entire page, uh, article, a simplified article, thus formatting, a selection, whatever, and you can easily chuck that into Evernote. And now you have that just in your little searchable database, again, from any device, you know, iPad, desktop computer, laptop computer, phone, whatever, you're easily able to search this. And I find it, you know, just for sharing things with my family. Like if we have documents that we need to hang on to for the kids or, you know, need access to, you know, you can make a shared notebook and you can share it with other folks, um, you know, within your family or at in a business context, you can do the same sort of thing. You could create a notebook per client and you could share it just with other folks at work, or you could actually share the notebook with a client. We did that when we were working collaboratively with a client on a user interface, we would throw mock-ups in there and do discussions around them and so forth and then new revisions of them spreadsheets with test data you know we kind of made it this repository that we used that the clients could easily access and upload their own artifacts into and so forth so evernote has been very very useful to me i pay for a premium subscription i could probably get away without one but actually i think they've slowly backed the feature set down now to where you kind of have to pay for premium but it's something like 60 bucks for the year like five bucks a month that's totally worth it for what you get with all those features and you know you drop your phone or something and lose it then uh all that stuff's been backed up to the cloud so you get a new phone you install evernote and boom everything gets downloaded back onto it also in that vein, that made me think of Google Photos. If you're not using Google Photos on your phone, I think you might be nuts. When you install it, Google Photos will then prompt you to say, hey, do you want me to back up all your photos to the cloud with Google Photos? You say yes. Every picture you take from your camera or camera roll, if you're on Apple, gets uploaded to Google Photos. They try and do facial rec on it, facial recognition. So you want to find all the pictures of Julia. You can log into the web client and say Julia, and it'll show all the pictures featuring that person. You want to find all pictures that have a whiteboard in them, type whiteboard, you can find those. You can create albums, and then it's very easy to share these albums with other folks. Anyone that has a Gmail can then collaborate with them, add to the albums if they want to. And again, you know, you drop that phone in a otherwise destroy it, crack the screen, whatever. All your photos have already been backed up off of there. 
Now, if you have an Android, you might be able to eject a SD card and also yank the high res originals off of there. But if you have an Apple, that's not going to happen. So I'm a big fan of Google Photos. Um, if you don't have it, definitely sign up for it. As far as coding tools, uh, I would say my favorite right now, my favorite developer tool is the GitHub desktop client for Windows. Uh, it makes working with GitHub very simple. You know, I, I, I know I said Windows. I sold that Mac SE30 a long time ago. Um, I predicted Windows would win the corporate desktop war way back in 1995, and I would say I've mostly been right. You know, Mac's definitely gaining ground now, and they have some great things they can thump their chest about, being the most valuable company on earth and so forth. And they do have some awesome products, but they're expensive and they have some warts like their digital rights management that kind of irk me. So I'm going to stick with Windows for now. The underserved of uh, operating systems, definitely not cool, somewhat AOL-like, but hey, it works, so I'm going to stick with it. Another question, what else do you do? So I have three daughters who all play soccer, so I spend a lot of time watching them and uh, recently have started to video the games and work with platforms that allow for video review and also using YouTube to share and so forth. We'll probably do an entire podcast on how technology has invaded and improved for the most part, kids' sports um, and sports in general. Uh, we'll talk about how it's used on a professional level as well. I'm also interested in travel. I like to travel with my family. I see new destinations as well as some kind of traditional ones that we do year after year. I like food. I got into making barbecue about five years ago and decided to get really good at it. Formed a barbecue team with some other soccer dads and folks from the tech industry. And we competed and won the rib challenge at Mohegan Sun three years in a row and came in second for wings a couple of years ago and got very good at making the KCBS meats, uh, brisket, pork shoulder, ribs, and chicken and so forth. So there's actually some technology involved there. We'll probably do an episode on uh, technology technology and food, not only in barbecue, but things like sous vide and so forth. I do like my craft beer and spirits and cars, especially Tesla's. Uh, Elon Musk is very impressive to me. When I saw the SpaceX, the Starman floating across the screen there a few Februarys ago, I was just flabbergasted, just amazed seeing that thunderstruck. I didn't know what to say. Big fan of his and his companies, so like to follow what they're doing, I'm reading a biography about him now. And that's about it for me. I'm going to wrap it up. I wanted to thank you for enjoying our inaugural edition of Underserved. We're going to have an email address set up for feedback and ideas. That is underserved at syrinx.com. Underserved, U-N-D-E-R-S-E-R-V-E-D -E -E at syrinx.com, which is spelled S as in Sam, Y as in yellow, R as in Romeo, I as in indigo, N as in Navajo, X as in x-ray.com. We'll also create a site for this, put some show notes up there. If you search for underserved podcast, you'll be able to find us. You can also tweet at me on Twitter. I am at sign Andrew Gelina, G-E-L-I-N-A. And we'll look forward to speaking with you again on the next podcast. I'm Andrew Gelina. Thank you for listening to Underserved. <laughs>